so I think um, we'll probably get started. And um, as you can see, the chat box is helpful. Um, certainly at some point we can unmute you and we can have uh, more of a back and forth conversation, but for now, um, if you, you want to type things into the chat box while I am talking, I think that would be great. Um, we have different kinds of people on this little webinar tonight. Actually, we have a lot of people from West Warwick, but we also have some people from um, a district in Massachusetts that I've worked with before, and I think we have a couple of administrators from our district and a few people that I met this weekend at a conference. So welcome to everyone. Um, as you probably got from the kind of title of this and the description of this webinar, I am part of the educational leader cadre um, for the state of Rhode Island for PARC. Um, and what that is, is PARC had decided that one way to get information out about the assessment was to get educators involved um, directly with them that could then go back to their states and their districts and provide information to folks around what's actually happening with the new assessment system that we're involved in in our states. Um, I went to Chicago over the summer and I'll be going three more times over the next two years to get this kind of information. Um, over the three days that I was there, I learned a lot of things that I did not know about this assessment and I knew that they were things that you would all be interested in and that would impact your classroom right away. So I wanted to put together a couple of webinars to, um, for those of you who are interested in getting the information that I got. Um, there's a lot of info. so. I'm not going to go too fast, but I am going to give you a lot of information in a short amount of time. So Jim's recording this, um, so you'll be able to listen to it at another time. I also um, am going to share this PowerPoint with you after the presentation, and a lot of my notes are below the slides. So you'll be able to get a lot of the information that I'm sharing um, afterwards as well, and you can always email me and ask me questions. Um, so this first section is just some basic stuff, but quite honestly, there were things that, again, I was glad to learn while I was there. Um, sorry, here we go. So um, you are all quite aware of the fact that we have Common Core Standards now in math and ELA, and they um, are really getting students ready for college and career. Um, there are two assessment consortia across the country that are going to be assessing students' knowledge with the Common Core Standards. And one of them is PARC, and one of them is Smarter Balance. Um, we're obviously PARC states. And um, the Doug Savdi, who is the director of PARC, was very clear to us to say that this is the purpose of PARC. It is to assess this, whether or not students are college and career ready. Um, he also recognizes that the PARC assessment is going to be used for other purposes. But while they develop the test, this is kind of their sole focus, um, getting students ready for college and career. Um, the intent and the design of PARC is to get you information in a timely fashion to inform instruction. So they recognize that having good information right away can help with things like RTI, um, curriculum revisions, uh, changing your instruction, deciding what PD you want to go with. So um, one of their main key uh, pieces of focus in creating this assessment is to create timely data. And I think you're going to see that as we go through these slides. Um, there's been lots of involvement from educators regarding the PARC assessment. So, for example, PARC started with something called the Model Content Frameworks, which I'm going to highlight for you in a little bit. Um, and they had teachers involved in that from the start. I, I was on a review team that looked at the documents from, I'd say, maybe about 10 months ago. Um, they even got some public review. Maybe some of you participated in it before they came out. Um, we actually have... Um, myself on the Educational Leader Cadre and two um, other educators in our district, Pat Alfonso and Monique Condon, who are also on item review teams for PARC. So they've really been reaching out and getting teachers involved, which is important. Um, in terms of post-secondary, this is really interesting. Uh, we have two uh, members from universities. Uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with Keys de Root, if, de Groot, if you know him from URI, he's one of our members um, on the post-secondary teams. And um, higher education is seriously discussing waiving remedial coursework for students who perform well in PARC in both the math and the ELA portion. So this is kind of the first time we're going to see a K-12 assessment have implications at the um, higher ed level. And I think that was one of the things that I, I took away that I thought was kind of important. PARC has a lot of goals, and I'm going to take you through them, but briefly, um, I really want to highlight number three. Uh, that was one of the reasons why this educator leader cadre was created. They really want to kind of build as much support as they can in for teachers along the way. 
Um, and I also want to mention number four and number six. So um, it was really important for them to develop technology-based assessments, and we'll see some examples of that in a minute, but they also wanted to balance that by um, creating an assessment that's sustainable and affordable. And obviously it's a challenge to kind of balance those two things, but um, they're, they're doing their best to, to do that. Right now there are 23 states that have committed to the park assessment, uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts being among them. There are also about 12 states who right now kind of have their feet in both. Um, so they're not sure where they're going to go. They're participating in both park and smarter balance right now. They haven't made any decisions, so the park stuff may grow. Um, we, Rhode Island is a member of the governing board for park, as is Massachusetts. Um, and as you start to get more information about park, you're going to notice probably Mitchell Chester. Um, he happens to be the commissioner of education in Massachusetts, um, giving, sending you a lot of correspondence. And, and that's because he is actually the chair of the governing board. Um, so if you see correspondence for him and you're wondering why things are coming out of Massachusetts, it's just simply because of his role on the governing board. Um, I mentioned that there's a lot of uh, higher ed institutions involved. Obviously, for number one, if we want to make sure students are college and career ready, it makes sense for those folks to be involved. Um, number three is is really something that's that's worthy of noting. So, um, Park recognizes that most state assessments right now do a really good job of measuring the middle. Um, they are really striving to create an assessment that has enough items on the test to find out where struggling students are struggling and where students are doing well um, will need a challenge. So uh, there's this real effort to create an assessment that uh, really gives you data on a range of students. And we usually don't see that in a state assessment, so the fact that they're really striving for that I think is important. Um, number five is also um, a, a piece of, of, you know, to note and also of concern. Um, they do recognize the need for states right now are asking, governing board states are asking for um, measures of growth and data for accountability purposes. So obviously those of us who are involved in teacher evaluation know that um, measures of growth are important um, and PARC is trying to, I guess, create an assessment that fairly um, fairly does that, which, which we, we know our state assessment NECAP right now does not do. So they have finalized the assessment design, um, and the graphic you see is the design of the assessment. Um, and this is both for ELA and math. Um, that, that's one thing to note. Today I'm going to share some information about both ELA and math. Um, when, as an educational leader cadre, the first of the three days when we're in Chicago, we get an update on both um, the ELA and the math assessment because um, we're the people that need to go back to our state and deliver this information. So they want to make sure we have a well-rounded understanding of the assessment. That being said, you'll see later on there are professional learning modules, at which point I tend to get, um, I am more involved in the math end of things, but some of the things I'll share today apply to both. Um, there are some interesting things about this design and there are some unfortunate things. So the diagnostic assessment and the mid-year assessment that you see on the left, um, those are optional assessments right now, um, which is kind of disappointing. So the diagnostic would be like an early indicator, non-summative kind of test that would give you information about um, what your students know and understand. It wouldn't be part of their um, you know, final effectiveness rating, kind of whether they're um, proficient or not, it would just be an indicator for the teacher. Um, the mid-year assessment would be performance-based, so it would be kind of like one of the mandatory pieces at the end, but you'd have a chance to see how students are performing with performance-based um, standards, things that are hard to measure. Um, originally, I will tell you that on this slide it says they would be potentially summative. Park is um, strongly advising that if states make the mid-year mandatory that it not be summative because if it were to be summative then it would dictate scope and sequence and PARC does not want to be in the business of dictating scope and sequence. So the diagnostic and the mid-year are um, only if your district decides they want to use them, only if your district can afford them. Ride, um, Phyllis Lynch is the chairperson for our educational leader cadre and she has said that um, while Rhode Island Department of Ed has made no decisions regarding this yet, it's probably going to be up to your local school district whether or not you purchase these. Uh, the pieces that are mandatory for districts are on the right-hand side. So there will be a performance-based assessment 
that will start um, somewhere close to the end of the year, as close to the end of the year as possible we would be administering that. Um, it can't be at the very end of the year because it will involve hand scored items, but um, this would be a very um, task-based, performance-based kind of thing with extended tasks, applications. Um, the other required piece would be an end of year assessment. That would be even closer to the end of the year. Um, it would be given on a computer um, so that the data can be um, received quickly. So you would have a, a rating for all of your students by the end of that school year, which for those of us in Rhode Island is very different than the data we get now. Um, what's important to note is that even though the end of the year assessment is computer based and will be scored quickly, you're going to see as we move on that traditional multiple choice questions are a thing of the past. That's not what they're going to look like anymore. So PARC has really tried to do a good job of creating innovative items that can be machine scored that really assess what students know and don't assess whether or not students can take a multiple choice test. So I think that's an important note. Um, there's also this speaking and listening assessment down here. Um, this will be required. Uh, it will be locally scored and it will not count towards the student's overall proficiency rating. So um, they haven't designed it yet. They couldn't give us a ton of information, but they did say that that will be a component. They just haven't, you know, decided exactly what it will look like. Um, I unfortunately, I think the fact that the diagnostic assessment is not uh, mandatory is unfortunate because Common Core, Park, the whole idea was to put everyone on a level playing field um, so that when we really get student proficiency ratings, we can kind of compare them across districts and states. And I think that districts who can't afford this are going to be at a distinct advantage over districts that can't. So um, I'm hopeful that the Department of Ed works on that. Um, they heard loud and clear from our group that went to Chicago that this was, we thought, going to be a concern for teachers. And, and I'll be interested to hear what you think about that. So um, this is just a little more information on each of those. And I, I've talked quite a bit about these um, optional assessment components and the summative required assessment components. Um, so PARC is really looking to create um, a whole pathway of resources for teachers and students and parents. And so you'll notice here that um, they've got some K2 formative assessments that are being developed. We all know formative assessment is a process and not, and not a bunch of items, but they are creating some tools that will help teachers kind of uh, check on how students are moving towards the grades three to eight standards. Um, these very clearly, Park is saying, should not be used as summative measures, should not be used um, for uh, determining if students in K2 are proficient in any way. However, Doug Savdi also mentioned that some race to the top states, and he did mention our commissioner by name, have already discussed using them for high stakes purposes. So even though they are being created by Park as a tool for teachers, it's certainly on the table in some states, Rhode Island being one of them, to use them in a summative way. Um, in grades three to eight, it's just really about giving you timely data to see where our kids are so we can provide some interventions. And at the high school level, um, obviously, they're looking at a college readiness score and um, they're also trying to build in some supports. So they're going to try to come up with some 12th grade bridge courses and some PD pieces to help uh, people along the way. Um, so in terms of supporting teachers, we're going to look at some of these supports tonight. The model content frameworks, if you haven't read them, if you haven't gone out to this site to check yours out, either in ELA or math, you're going to want to make it a priority. Um, I'm hoping as we look at the released items tonight and the item prototypes, you're going to see why it's so important for you to take a look at those and, and kind of dig into them. Um, PARC is creating some professional learning modules. They are delivering them to the education leader cadres when we go out to Chicago so we know how to use them and then we can bring them back to our districts. So if they're any worthwhile, obviously in West Warwick, I will bring them back and offer them to you. Uh, PARC has also released some item and task prototypes. They released a bunch a couple of weeks ago and they've promised another whole batch of them at the end of September. So you'll see more of what I'm going to show you tonight coming out soon. Uh, a neat thing that they're doing is this Partnership Resource Center. So they are going to create an online place where high quality resources for teachers exists. So, you know, PARC is an assessment consortium. They're not really a group that's going to be creating these resources, but they want to house them. They want to have a place where you can go to find all the best stuff. Um, for example, when we were in Chicago, we learned about some exciting things that are going on in North Carolina and Ohio, some really useful teacher, teacher resources. Park wants to kind of pull those all together in one place for you so that you can find them, which I think is kind of useful. 
Um, so this particular goal is around technology. Uh, they gave us a lot of specs and guidelines for um, what your computers have to have to support the park assessment. Jim is probably the only one who's interested in those, so I'll just let him read my notes when I send the PowerPoint. I will tell you that PARC is device agnostic, which means that um, they're not writing their tests to run better on any particular computer than other computers. Um, however, the main uh, requirement for a computer is that it has to be, be able to be locked down. So a computer would have to be locked down so that a student can take the assessment in a virtual space but not have the ability to go outside of that space. Um, so Apple's not too happy with PARC because the iPad can't be locked down and lots of districts have iPads. and um, I was actually curious about our slates, whether they can be locked down um, as well. So I guess we'll kind of see on that. But there's some information here for you about the technology um, and the assessments. Um, this slide is just about accountability. So, you know, Park was pretty clear that assessments can only do certain things and still remain reliable and valid. So Park is really not being designed for anything other than to measure a student's knowledge and performance as it relates to the Common Core standards. But um, again, as we know, you can see here that um, you know districts have expressed an interest in using the park for school and district effectiveness, educator effectiveness, etc. Um, and you notice this little disclaimer on the bottom that you know they're designing them um, as states deem appropriate. Obviously, they can use them in any any way that they wish. So um, that's kind of the, the overview of just the, the basic PARC 101. This is kind of where they are at the assessment, um, the goals that they have, and, um, and kind of the basic stuff. So I don't know if, um, I think because you're going to get sick of me talking, if we could stop here. Um, and I'm trying to read the question box. If you wanted to um, kind of just stop for a minute and type in, you know, if you could type in something you heard that you think is important, something you heard that was new to you, so I can kind of see where you're at. Um, you can also feel free to type in questions, like I'm seeing a question from Karen. Um, are the PBAs given to all students? What are the requirements for ELLs who have come into the country? Will they be assessed as soon as they come in? Um, Performance-based assessments would be given to all students. You get one summative score. Um, that weights the per performance-based assessment with the end of year. They haven't actually decided the weight yet, but the two of them together will, will come up with one kind of summative rating for a student's proficiency. Um, they are toying with whether or not they want to, um, toying with whether or not they want to uh, translate this, the math portion, into any other language. They will not be translating the ELA into any other language. They are firm on that, and they're not sure about the math. Um, and Last, when we asked this question, Karen, because people asked this question while we were in Chicago, they were working right now on, an, on a document for English language learners um, regarding, you know, when they come in and how long they have to be here before they're assessed. So there was, they were deep in discussion around that. It's going to be a policy decision, um, and they just weren't at that point yet. Oh, and I'm hearing, I'm seeing Kristen couldn't hear me. I'm wondering if she can hear me now. Oh, thanks, Kristen. Uh, Julie's asking about students on an accelerated track. So, um, so Julie, I think you're a math teacher, so you're probably asking about math. Um, there will be a park designed for students who are taking the accelerated track at the middle level. So um, if there are students who are taking that uh, seventh grade and half of eighth grade uh, park uh, common core class in seventh grade, and then in eighth grade, they're taking the rest of eighth grade in algebra one, um, there will be an assessment for them. Beyond that, at the high school level, you take the park at the course level, not the grade level. So depending on what course they're in, um, they would take the park. In terms of math, um, it will be up to states. Right now, they're planning to have an Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 park available. Or if you go Integrated Math 1, Math 2, Math 3, that's all they're planning on making available um, for the launch in 2014-15. Um, so students could take that at any time that they were ready for those assessments. It'll be up to your state to decide what they're going to make mandatory for graduation. So I've heard different things from different people in Rhode Island. Will it just be algebra and geometry? Will it be all three? I'm not sure where Massachusetts is going, but um, they will definitely be, um, again, course-based. 
Uh, Becky wants to know if we don't give diagnostic tests, does it make it more difficult to see student growth? I mean, I think so, Becky. And, and I just also think the diagnostic test would give us good information. But again, um, Park's not making it mandatory. They heard loud and clear when they originally had four mandatory assessments that districts thought that was too much and too costly. So um, they made those two pieces, which I think are the most valuable pieces, optional. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful Ride Ride will do something about that. And, you know, if we're going to spend race to the top money, you know, maybe we spend it for something like that. Uh, Mandy, kids that are not proficient at keyboarding be at a disadvantage. Yes, they will. Um, you'll see in the released items in a minute that for younger kids, there's talk of a blend. So when students have to justify their thinking or answer some questions that they might be writing in a booklet, since um, you'll see the types of tasks in a minute, since type two and type three tasks, um, have to be hand scored anyway. Um, there's no need to type, although at the high school level it looks like they're going um, with typing all the way and I think there's going to be a learning curve. When you see some of these technology enhanced items, lots of kids have probably more experience with computers than we do, so they might do fine with them. They're kind of like the games they play, the apps on their iPad. Um, for other kids though, yeah, I mean I think they're going to be at a disadvantage. Um, science and social studies, Kristen's asking about, do they have exams? Um, science and social studies are not on Park's radar right now, so Again, PARC is designed to assess um, the Common Core Standards, which are right now only for English Language Arts and Mathematics. Um, there, there are new science standards being formed, but they're not part of the Common Core, and so therefore PARC is not uh, part of assessing them. So right now it, it's all about um, ELA and math. Um, Julie, that's a good question. Um, Julie's saying she's seen a couple different options for middle school accelerated courses. Is Park assuming that most districts will do the acceleration at seventh grade? Um, I think they are because they were using that Achieve document, but um, I will, I'll jot this question down, Julie, and our educational leader, Cadre, has a webinar next month, and I can, I'm going to ask them for sure and, and find out for you. Um, Carrie came in late. She wants to know, students will be assessed in all areas in grades 3 through, it, it might not be 3 through 12. It's probably going to be 3 through 11 or 3 through 10, um, depending on what our state decides, Carrie, but it definitely won't include grade 12. Um, Amy wants to know, will we be able to use any of the data as diagnostic, specifically for students performing below grade level? It's not repetitive, Amy. Um, and the answer is, I don't know. Um, and I don't think they know, quite honestly. Um, you'll see in a minute that when students take the first park in 2014-15, it won't be until they get the student data that they can even do standard setting. So, um, so that data is, even from the first batch, isn't going to be great. But yes, they are, if you remember from a previous slide, they are really trying to create an assessment that will do some backing up so that if you, let's say you have a fourth grade student who's on a second grade level, um, you know, while they're going through the park, it might adjust itself a little. So we know they're not meeting fourth grade standards, but you know, are they meeting third? Are they meeting second? And and if that's the case, it can it would give you some good information. But remember, they're they're in the early stages of building this, so that's one of their goals and one of their uh, pieces of focus. But um, you know, until we we see the full test, I'm I'm not sure if I'll be convinced that they can do that. Missy asked a good question about accommodations, and Missy, I'm going to have you hold on for a second because when I get into the next section, I'll be able to kind of show those to you, so it might be a little more um, visual for people. And if I don't answer that, Missy, remind me. Um, how can we take the test online with limited technology in the classroom? So park the park assessment, and that's kind of who I'm sharing the information from. That's not um, so much their issue as it is the issue of the state and the district. So um, they haven't. You know, they've given guidelines around what technology folks need to get going. Um, they have not really, um, they haven't really dealt with that issue. They think that's more of a state issue. I do know that Phyllis Lynch was, again, talking about Rhode Island Department of Ed's role in that and making sure we've got the bandwidth and the infrastructure and the computers um, to, to do that. Luckily for you, Lynn, uh, grade two doesn't have to worry about that. I know you're getting kids ready for it, though. Um, Mandy, if we use this for teacher evaluation, yeah, so it can't. Um, it's definitely not going to apply to teachers that teach below third grade. Um, if you heard me mention that there will be a K-2 formative assessment piece that, um, again, is meant to be used in a formative way instructionally. Um, some states have expressed an interest in trying to use it in a summative 
fashion. But again, um, I think I think that Park is discouraging that. Now, if you could find a way to use those formative assessment tasks for you, I think that would make a lot of sense just for SLO purposes and things like that. But um, I think that would be your choice, yeah, which is probably a good thing. Um, but I mean, you obviously play a role in it, getting kids ready. But it, it won't it won't kind of apply to you. All right, so I'm thinking we might be done with with questions right now. So I'm going to kind of move into the next section um, because I think this next section really has a lot of bearing on your instruction. It's this next section that I really wanted to get this information out to people because I know that we're all working on you know new curriculum and new assessments all the time, and I thought having this information would make your time um, better spent. So Park has a lot of new acronyms. So ECD stands for evidence-centered design. Um, so this section is on evidence-centered design and the content frameworks. And again, if you haven't spent time with the content frameworks, I hope the one thing you leave this webinar with is the fact that you need to get in there and spend some time with them. Um, so we're just going to go back to good classroom instruction for a minute and think about um, this kind of like understanding by design. So we know that a good teacher um, kind of starts off planning their lesson with an objective. So, you know, they make a claim, like, I want my students to be able to do this. And they probably make that claim based on a standard, okay? Um, and in order to support those claims, they say, okay, what kind of evidence do I need to gather from my students to decide if they've been able to do what I wanted them to do, whatever my objective or my claim was. And so once we decide what kind of evidence we want, it's then that we decide on the task for our classroom, or um, that we decide on, you know, what are we going to have kids do and what are we going to do to get kids ready. So this, they call this evidence-centered design, this starting with a claim, what kind of evidence do I want, let me design my task. We know that's what good teaching looks like. So the nice part about PARC is they decided that since that's what good teachers do, that that's what they should do to build their assessment. So the, um, they've contracted with two um, different vendors, Pearson and ETS. Uh, they purposefully decided to hire two because they thought they could learn from one another and they also thought a little bit of friendly competition would benefit the park assessment in the end. Um, those vendors know that their items have to follow this process to be considered. So park won't allow recycling of old items. Um, they're forcing both Pearson and ETS to create authentic um, and new items for park and they have to go through this process. So they make a claim about what they want students to know and that claim is tied to standards um, and comes right from a document I'm going to show you that you have access to. Um, then they decide what kind of evidence they want to gather and then they actually create the assessment item. So all assessment items go through the same process um, that good teaching kind of goes through which is somewhat comforting I think. Um, so again, a couple times here I've, I've given you a link to go to the content frameworks at some point to take a look, although I'm going to show you some highlights from both the math and ELA. Um, they, um, they, again, it's important to note that no task models will be created, none that don't align to the PARC model content framework. So the document that you're going to be using to drive your instruction is the same document that um, the item writers are going to be using to create their items. And again, that's different. Like we never saw the, the document that DCAP um, item folks used. Now, now we all use the same document. So, um, so the document that I'm referring to that everyone's going to be using are the model content frameworks. Um, in ELA and literacy, um, the document was created, uh, you know, the standard document themselves is like 100 plus pages long. Uh, the model content frameworks is a paring down of that and it kind of helps you make sense of the standards. Like, what am I really responsible for? So there's a focus and a frame of the critical key advances in the standards in the document. Um, there's a lot of focus on um, the organization. So those of you who are ELA teachers know that um, know that there's there's a lot to organize here. There's four strands of the Common Core in ELA, um, and it gets a little difficult to think about how this might look over the course of the year. So in the model content frameworks at each grade level, they present one possible model 
for how student for how the standards can be organized. Um, and they really focus on how you can frame the key advances. They kind of warn you that these aren't a complete guide to curriculum development. They're really just one kind of way you can think about organizing. Um, how can reading complex texts uh, kind of lead into writing and lead into the research project? And how can we balance literature and information only? They really just give you one model for how you might start to think about organizing at your grade level. Um, I will also mention that in the ELA content frameworks, um, there's a lot of emphasis on knowing what kind of comes before and after you, what are the critical shifts and changes from grade level to grade level, which again, um, you don't get as much in the standard document. It's really highlighted here in the content frameworks. Um, the content frameworks also emphasize the fact that a lot of people, when the Common Core first came out, heard a lot about close reading. Close reading is important. Close reading is important. And you'll see in the items in a minute that it is. Um, but the content frameworks also really let you know that volume of reading is critical as well. Um, and Park is really kind of talking about the fact that you need to have both close reading and volume of reading. And I know for reading teachers, that's important. Um, in the most recent revision of the content frameworks for ELA, the one that's online, they've also added a glossary, um, which you know, can help you with all of the terms that are embedded in the Common Core for ELA. That was something that in the first document, um, the public comment period, everyone asked for. And Park is trying to be as responsive as possible. So you'll notice in the online version, there's also a glossary of terms, which quite honestly, not being an ELA person, I found incredibly useful when I was reading the, the content frameworks. Uh, in mathematics, the um, content frameworks are two separate documents. So there's a grade three to eight document, and then there's a high school document. Um, the high school one actually came out in draft form, I want to say about eight months ago, and um, the standards writers for math, Jason Zimba and Bill McCallum, were horrified by it. So Park went right back to the drawing board, and they've most recently released a, a new draft that is um, it's excellent. So um, the document focuses on the critical advances in the standards. So it focuses on um, you know where you should focus in your classroom. Um, it talks about building students' knowledge and conceptual understanding and kind of ability to um, apply to a new situation. And it really focuses on how the content standards line up with the math practices. Um, one of the most important features, I think, in the math, um, the math document is this. So they have taken every single grade level, and this is just a snapshot of, of a grade level. I'm not even sure which grade this is. might be four um, or five. Anything that's keyed green is considered major content for your grade level. Um, anything that's in blue is supporting content. Uh, supporting content means can mean one of two things. It, it's probably things that support the major content at your grade level, but it also might be things that support major content in the next grade level. So it's kind of you've got to build some understanding but mastery is not required. Um, and then finally there are additional clusters and those are in yellow. And I think um, this part of the, the model content framework is critical for a couple of reasons. Number one, PARC has indicated very strongly and clearly on a slide coming up that 70% of the PARC assessment in math will assess major clusters. So that means that these standards don't have the same grain size. If 70% of the assessment is going to assess the major clusters, that means that 30% will be a combination of supporting and additional. So when you think about time spent in your classroom, um, I think looking at these model content frameworks can help you with the time that you're spending. Um, they can also help us decide which assessments make sense to use in the district. Uh, and if you're a special educator, and I know we have some of you on the call, um, you know you can't get to all of this with your students, and so this helps you make some really good choices because they've kind of identified major content for you. Um, now, if you are a K through two teacher, don't feel left out. Um, there is a, a, a consortium called Engage New York. Um, if you Google Engage New York, you'll pull them right up. Um, they are a tri-state network of New York, Rhode Island, and Mass, although I don't know anyone who's working on it. Um, they're working with a couple of the, the researchers around this, and they've created um, similar documents that look just like this for K1 and 2, where they've done some work on identifying major supporting and additional. Obviously, they don't impact the assessment as much as they've really looked at um, how the standards grow from grade to grade to help identify areas of focus for you. So they're worth checking out. I, I've seen them, and I, and I think they're really well done. So um, as you can see, it's, it's kind of important to 
if you haven't, um, get into those model content frameworks and, and definitely check them out at your grade level. They, they help you organize and, and think about the time you want to spend and, and how you want to organize your units. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the um, assessment itself, and I'm going to do a little ELA first and then math. Um, for ELA teachers, this is this this slide says a lot. Um, there are three big boxes along the top, okay, and these are going to result in three different scale scores for students that are going to be put together to um, create their rating, whether or not they are proficient, um, highly proficient, etc. Um, so there are three major pieces that are going to be assessed, which is important. Um, Students are going to, um, let me see, I want you to notice that in the research piece here, it doesn't say that students are going to gather information. Um, because this is a closed task, students will get a simulated research task where they need to build from what's given. So in other words, um, they're going to be provided potential text to choose from rather than asking students to go out and gather the text themselves. So you notice that even though the standard says that they need to gather the claim that's driving the ELA assessment says that they're just going to use kind of what's provided. Um, this research task is going to require students to read one extended text and they consider that to be a piece that's a few pages in length. They said about 800 to 1500 words from elementary to high school. Um, they're going to have to answer some questions that are designed to help them gather information and they're going to have to solve a research problem that's been posed. And as we move through, um, I actually have an example of that um, uh, going forward so you'll get to kind of see exactly what that looks like. Um, in ELA and literacy there are only going to be three item types on the assessments and we're going to see all of these in a minute. So there's a prose constructed response which um, will kind of look like uh, what you would expect, a, a constructed response where, where there's a prompt, although you'll see that the prompts are never um, decontextualized, they're always in response to a text, always, always. Um, there's an evidence-based selected response. So in ELA they are going to continue to have some um, traditional selected response, multiple choice items, however, there will always be a follow-up question asking them to provide evidence, um, which piece of evidence helped you to make that decision. So they're kind of um, trying to ramp it up a bit in that way and give you some more information about did your student guess or did they really know, can they tie it to evidence. Um, and then finally a technology enhanced constructed response item we'll see later on might involve them highlighting some evidence or dragging and dropping or you know kind of engaging with the text in the way they would in your classroom, being able to highlight, pull things out things like that. Um, mathematics is also based on claims, okay, so the math assessment is based on five claims, or they call them five subclaims. Now if you are an elementary teacher, these five claims make up a student's summative rating. If you are a teacher in middle and high school, you can ignore this last one because it does not apply to you. Um, this is a fluency piece. You'll notice in the model content frameworks, um, it actually tells you which fluency uh, requirements there are at each grade level, so it pulls them right out for you, <coughs> excuse me, so you know um, what to focus on. Now this is the piece I was talking about, this claim right here, students solving problems involving the major content, 70% of the assessment, additional and supporting, 30%. So these two are the content kind of claims. These two claims, math reasoning, which involves, you know, constructing an argument, critiquing someone else's reasoning, and solving real-world problems with modeling. These will always be in play. So in other words, I might be assessing a major content piece and assessing reasoning at the same time, or maybe I'm assessing an additional piece with some modeling. So you can almost think of this as 70-30 and like 50-50. So these pieces will always be in play um, regardless of the content pieces that are, are going on. And again, you'll see that in a minute in the items. Math has three types of items as well, but they're a little different. So um, type one items are machine scorable, um, and they're, I know there's a lot of acronyms here, they're going to show up in the performance-based assessment and the end of year, um, but again, machine scorable doesn't mean multiple choice, and you're going to see that in a minute. Um, on the performance-based assessment, you're also going to see type two and type three problems. Type two are hand scored and they have to do with that reasoning claim that we just looked at and type three are hand scored and they have to do with the modeling claim that we just looked like. There's some overlap here, some of them have to do with both reasoning and modeling, but for now this is how they're kind of um, categorizing them. 
at this point. So just a quick recap of where we are with PARC before we look at the items. So they released the model content frameworks in 2011, although they've revised them since, and I hope you look at them. Uh, they've got some item development that's begun, and here we go. We've got some items that have been released that we're going to look at. Um, they launched the educator, aider, educator Leader Cadre so that there are people like me who can bring this information back to you. Ride is working on how to use us in a better way to reach out across the whole state, but for right now, I thought it was worthwhile to share this information with people I know. Um, and finally, they, as I said, they updated the model content frameworks and, and they're much better now. And, and they are, again, the document that the item writers are using. So we need to be familiar with it. There's a lot of stuff that's coming. And so as I go to these meetings in Chicago, if I hear good stuff, I'll bring it back to you. If not, I won't waste your time. But um, the Partnership Resource Center should be launched when I get back there in the spring. So I'm hoping to be able to at least forward that to you and share it. Uh, they are doing a little bit of field testing now. They're going to expand a field test several more times. Um, I'm hoping we get involved in some of this expanded field testing so we get to take a look at it, but um, you won't be able to be involved unless you have the, the technology capability, so we'll see. Um, these model instructional units are going to start to be released in the spring. If they're useful, I'll definitely offer them as voluntary sessions in our district for you guys, as long with the professional development modules. Um, K2 teachers, we should see those formative tools next fall. So we can take a look at whether or not you think they're useful to you. Um, I'm not sure what college ready tools are. I think those are the pieces to support the high school teachers. That's a little later. Um, you will notice that the diagnostic, the assessment that is um, voluntary, and the mid-year are really not going to come out until they need to. Um, and they've, quite honestly, because they're not mandatory, they're down the list on the things PARC has to accomplish. And so people aren't really going to get a look at them until it's almost the time to give them. Um, but again, they're not summative, so it'll just be a decision of whether or not they're useful for you in your district. Um, obviously, we all have to give the summative park for the first time in the spring of 2015. And again, it won't be until they get that student data that they can actually set standards for the park. So you'll find out, you know, we'll find out much later if it's a valid and reliable tool. The good news around that, for those of us who are in teacher evaluation in Rhode Island, um, that data is not going to be good to use for, for growth model data, um, at least not in the first year. So one more year of, of just relying on our SLOs, which is, which is probably a good thing. So before I get into the released items, I don't know if there's anything um, in that last section that you heard that um, you wanted to kind of point out, or if there was a question you had in that last section before I show you some of the items. Maybe I've just bored you to tears and you've signed off. So I'm hearing that there is a standard um, from Nancy, that there's a standard, a seventh grade standard, that's designated as additional in one place and in-depth focused on another section of park. So I'm wondering, um, Nancy, I'm, I'm assuming it's designated as additional in the model content frameworks. Um, what can you tell me where else you're seeing it in a park document? I will tell you that um, some of the things that are designated in the Common Core standards as an in-depth area of focus are not designated as major in the Park Model Content Frameworks document. That happens more than once. So again, the Model Content Frameworks document is created by Park, and it's driving the assessment. So if it's major, it's going to be um, it's going to be assessed. 70, you know, it'll, it'll be part of what makes up 70% of the assessment. There are places where the standards writers and the park folks do not agree. Um, and we notice several of those and that may be one of them. So if that's the case, if it's, if it's identified for focus in the standards and it's a major content piece or it's additional rather in, in the park document, then um, for assessment purposes, I would go with what the park document says. Um, you may not agree with that. Oh, Mia's still here. That's good. Um, Julie thought that race to the top districts are testing with PARC next year. Um, Julie, you're in Massachusetts, so uh, there may be something different going on in your state, but um, PARC won't be ready um, to be an actual test until 2014-15. Um, perhaps your district is piloting, but um, the, the assessment won't actually be ready for kind of prime time until 2014-15. Until so Nancy, yes, so that's what happened. So definitely um, go with the PARC document for now, even though I reviewed the standards document and sometimes I agree with them more than the park document. Um, Julie, yep, from the timeline, the end of year won't be ready for you to use that. 
All right, so Nancy's saying it's in park. Oh, that's interesting. All right, Nancy, I'm going to write that down along with um, Julie's question from earlier, and I can, um, I'll try to get clarification on that next time I have Doug Sabdi on the, on the line. If you would do me a favor later, Nancy, and just tell me where it is in the document so I don't have to go finding it. That way I can, I can talk to them about it and sound like I know what I'm, what I'm saying. Um, Susan wants to know, will PARC identify those 8th grade content frameworks that will be included in the 7th grade test and the 8th grade content frameworks in the Accelerated Algebra 1? Yep, that's in the hopper. That's something that they were working on. Um, and at this point, um, again, kind of like the diagnostic in the mid-year, it was a little lower on their list, unfortunately, because, um, you know, they're trying to get the, the main frame of the assessment out there. But um, People did ask that, and Doug said they were working on those pieces. Um, Mandy, I don't think there'll be practice tests, but there definitely are going to be prototype items, which I'm going to share with you, that are going to be out there, um, and, and you'll see that they're interactive um, so kids can practice and get comfortable. Um, they're going to keep building up this bank of items over the next couple of years. That's their goal. So it'll be less a practice test and more an item bank. So that's probably a good segue into items. Um, I think the way I organize this is I'm going to share, uh, I think, three or four math items and three or four ELA items. I will tell you that um, even if you're not an, a math teacher and vice versa, it's actually really worthwhile to look at all the items because um, the technology they're using for the ELA items is, even if it's not in the release prototypes now, is going to show up in math items and vice versa. And also, your students are going to be taking a new kind of assessment, and you're going to see that there's a lot of parallels between math and ELA, and you might want to be able to make those connections for your kids so that, you know, quite honestly, they'll be more comfortable. So, um, so the beauty of a webinar is you can tune me out, and I won't know, but I, I do think it's worthwhile to, uh, to listen to both. I, I've learned a lot about the math end from looking at the ELA piece. So um, the good news about the park assessment is that they're really trying to um, create items that are worth doing. So they're not a bunch of um, procedural stuff. They're really good math. Um, I told you before there's no reusing of items, so the developers know the claims process. They have to follow it, and they have to use that, that document that we've been talking about. Um, this is what I, I spoke to you about before, the 70% or more of the major work. Um, this slide is, is, is fairly old in that um, at the time, they could only guarantee 70% or more in the major work in grades 3 through 8. They've now guaranteed that for... Um, high school courses that go the traditional route. So if you're going algebra, geometry, algebra two, if you are an integrated um, district and we are not, um, they're still playing around with the number. They don't want to say 70% or more until they are sure. Um, but again, you notice that there's also an emphasis on multiple solutions. So you're going to see that even in a technology item, there's uh, ways for students to show things in multiple ways, uh, which is, I think, kind of a neat thing in an assessment that we haven't seen before. Um, this integrative task piece is huge. So those of us who um, take NECAP, and uh, MCAS is the same way usually, you look at an item that they release, and it's aligned to a standard. So its standards are kind of like a checklist on the NECAP. That's not the case on the park. You're never going to see an item tagged to one standard anymore. Um, items are designed to always assess a content standard and a standard for math practice at the very least, and many of them incorporate several content standards and several standards for math practice. So you're going to see that there's never going to be an item that assesses just kind of one thing. Uh, they're moving away from that as fast as they can. Um, and then finally, when we look at the items, the items they're created are kind of created in three ways. So some items are helping assess conceptual understanding that kids have developed. Some items are assessing procedural kind of fluency. And some items are assessing application or transfer. Um, once this document came out and once I went to this park workshop, I've been working with middle and high school teachers on designing our curriculum in this way. So right in our curriculum documents, we've tagged lessons as a CU lesson, conceptual understanding, a PF lesson, procedural fluency. They were calling this transfer for a while, so we tagged stuff with a T. We might want to change it to an A for application or not. We know what it means. Um, so this is something that elementary teachers that we've started to transition to park, we might want to go back into your curriculum document and start doing some of this tagging because I think it'll help us think about the kinds of lessons we're teaching in the classroom so that, you know, students are ready to, to deal with these kinds of um, asks on the assessment. Um, Melissa, Missy, 
Missy, this is where I'm going to get back to your questions. So there are a lot of technology enhancements being built in for IEP students, um, and that's kind of neat. So um, for example, there are um, certain uh, features that you can turn on and off. So a student who struggles with reading can hover over a word and see um, it can be read to them, or a definition can be provided, or um, you know, it, it, you name it. There's a whole group of people that spoke about this while I was there. They're, they're building in lots of technology enhancements so that um, students who have certain accommodations in their IEP can be provided with them and they're um, things that can be turned on and off in the system. Which I think will be nice because those kids, for the most part, won't have to be taken out to another room to take the test. They can kind of be part of what everyone else is engaging in. Um, and again, there's a lot of transformative stuff. So there's simulations, game-like environments. I'm not going to read it to you. You're going to see it. Um, but I do want to stress this again really avoiding selected response items. So they don't want kids saying, well, it can't be A and it can't be D, so I'm going to pick between B and C, and or if I just plug all of these answers back into the problem, I'll find the answer. Park doesn't want to assess whether or not kids know how to take a test. They want to assess whether or not kids understand the math. Uh, and so I think that's kind of a refreshing approach, I guess, to the assessment. Um, when you are looking at your math standards, there are three types of math standards that are um, influencing the task creation on the test. So these two standards, third grade and high school, these are what Park considers um, explicit practice integrated standards, which means if I'm a third grade teacher, I know that this um, Park is going to create an item for this standard that looks at equivalent fractions. But because right in the standard it is asking students to explain why, I also know that it is going to assess standard for math practice three. It's very explicit that there's a practice, a math practice embedded in this standard, which means that Park is never going to ask students to recognize and generate simple equivalent fractions without asking them to explain why. So Park says, hey, this is explicit. The practice standard is explicit. So when you teach this, you don't have to guess how Park's going to assess this. This is how it's going to be assessed. Same thing with this high school um, standard on arithmetic and geometric sequences. Again, the word modeling is right in the standard. So you know that this apply, you know, this is a direct correlation to standard for math practice. I think it's four or five um, around modeling situations. You know they're never going to assess arithmetic and geometric sequences without asking students to model. So they consider these practice integrated explicit standards. You know in your teaching what standard for math practice is going to be married to this standard um, on the assessment. So that helps, I think, in the classroom a lot. There are also some standards that they consider to be um, have practice um, practices implicit in them. So this is a fourth grade multiplication standard. Um, and while it doesn't have the wording of a math practice in there, and be careful because it explains in there, but that's not what it's saying, illustrate and explain the calculation by using equations, rectangular arrays, or area models. And because you're using all of these representations, again, you know that Park is never going to assess this multiplication without asking for that standard for math practice around modeling. So that modeling standard is implicit. It's not directly stated there, but we know that's what they're looking for. Now this next type gets a little tricky. These are called practice forward tasks. So practice forward is, it looks like this. Park's not going to assess a content piece without a practice. So they say, okay, we want to assess um, whether or not students can deal with linear functions. So the assessment um, the item creators will uh, create an item that is going to assess linear functions, but also is going to pull a practice forward. So they design a task that you can't get full credit on unless you use a practice. So they might design a task where you really need to have to look for and make use of structure, standard for math practice seven, in order to complete this task on linear functions. What's neat about that is that Park has put out, and this is one of their PD modules that they shared with us, a bunch of task descriptions that teachers can kind of sit down and go through and say, okay, what practice is Park trying to pull forward? Like what practice would students have to use with this content to be successful? Um, it's a pretty neat activity to do and it helps you think about how to do that in your classroom. So the bottom line is you can't, Park is never going to assess content without a practice tied to it. So we can't teach content anymore without a practice tied to it. That, that constantly has to be that, that kind of connection in our classrooms. Um, so we're going to look at a grade three item. 
And this on the website is interactive, but I just grabbed a screenshot to save time, so I'm not going back and forth 15 times on you. Um, so we've got an item where a farmer plants three-fourths of the field with soybeans. Um, and a student has to drag the soybean to the field as many times as needed to show the fraction of the field that is planted with soybeans. So this is a type one item. You would either see this on a, a performance-based or an end-of-year exam. Um, it focuses on claims A and C. So A, because it's major work of the grade, this, this standard around fractions um, is major work in grade three. Um, and it's also um, asking for students, you'll see in the second part, to, um, to explain their reasoning. So it's also tied to that reasoning claim. Um, and it's considered a practice forward task since the students have to link abstract symbols three-fourths to like a quantity that it represents. So it's a practice forward task. It's pulling that practice forward. Um, when you look at part B, they have to create a different fraction that's kind of equivalent to three-fourths. Um, and they can still look at their picture when they do that and, and explain their thinking. So, um, so, so you'll notice that this is unlike a traditional multiple choice assessment. Um, it's difficult to guess the correct answer or use an elimination strategy. Um, also, unlike multiple choice, there's more than one correct solution, but it's still machine scorable. Um, and, you know, unlike paper and pencil, there is this nice visual piece that students can use. Um, and, and that piece, and this piece, can be scored automatically, so you get kind of quick data with a short piece that has to be hand scored. So again, they're, they're trying to get at um, testing a concept, not um, test taking skills. And when you go out to the site, I'll show you how to get that you can play around with these. So this is a grade seven item. Um, in this item, students would look at these graphs and look at these tables, um, and then they would think about the speed of an object, and they would they would kind of analyze these and decide, they'd slide these over um, in order from greatest speed to least speed, which object has the greatest speed all the way down to, to the least. Um, again, this would be a claim A kind of an item because it's assessing major work of the grade. Um, it's a type one item, so we'd see this on the end of year for sure. Um, and it's it would be pulling forward the standard for math practice one. Because standard for math practice one is looking for students to compare um, different representations like tables and, um, and graphs in order to solve problems. Um, what's interesting about this problem is it's a multi-point problem, so it allows for partial credit. Um, and it's also multi-point because, um, again, Park wants to stay true to the focus of the Common Core standards. So um, since this is a major work of the grade problem, they'll have it be worth more points than something that maybe isn't major work of the grade. Um, also in the interface you'll see online there's a four function calculator available that students can pull up for this item. So if it's a calculator item, the calculator widget comes up. If it's not, it doesn't. Um, we're going to look at a, a high school item really quick. This is another type one item where um, students would have this equation and when they're finished they have to enter the solutions below. And you'll notice some things about this item. So first of all, the item doesn't immediately indicate the number of correct solutions. So students can click the plus sign when they want to enter another solution. You know, that automatically kind of ramps up the, we're not testing, test taking skills. Like I know there's got to be two, let me find them. It's, you know, do I understand this equation or not? Um, the students would actually not see this title that's up here. They would just see what's in the box. So this is another one of those practice forward items because it, um, it pulls forward standard for math practice seven. So students have to look for structure. They have to recognize that this is a quadratic. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to solve it. So again, another um, item that you'd see on an end of year that's not multiple choice. That um, that also and also it would involve some partial credit. So you can get full credit for entering two correct solutions because there are two correct solutions to this item, um, and you get partial credit for a single. Um, single solution. Now there are a whole bunch more of these tasks out on um, the Dana Center site. The Dana Center is hosting um, something called the Park Prototype Project for Math. I'm going to take you out there for just a second to show you how it's organized. There are um, elementary school tasks, middle and high school. Um, I will show you that um, when you get there, there you know, aren't as many tasks as you'd like to see, but they're building them up. And all of the tasks that are here are interactive. So, um, you know, I've got a baseball stadium with different numbers of seats, and students can kind of drag. Um, and Mandy, these are all um, for kids to practice because they can submit their answer and see if they're correct and, and move along to practice. Um, you'll notice here that 
Um, the, the problem is involving some reasoning, so it says to write your answer in an answer booklet, which is again something they're going to play around with in with the pilot for younger kids who aren't that good at keyboarding. Um, part C would also involve some writing the answer in the answer booklet. These are nice because you can see the partial scoring and the way that they're planning to um, assess these items, which again I think is really useful for your instruction. You also can see the common core alignment. Um, which tells you which standards for math practice it's pulling forward and also which of the content standards are available. So there are a lot of tasks out here. Um, this golf balls and water at the high school level is a great example. Um, this is a great example of a standard for math practice one. We want students to be able to connect tables to verbal descriptions and so students will actually do a little bit of, of sliding into the verbal description to determine if their answer is correct. So there's a lot of um, the items that are out here, and this really goes to Mandy's question earlier, um, will help you with uh, the, the idea of, of having students kind of play around. They can play around in that toolbox. So, um, so feel free to check those out. The type two this is a typo, and type three tasks for math are available out there. And, and again, you can kind of check those out. So we're going to move on to literacy, and I, I'm recognizing that um, we're past 7 o'clock. So um, I, you know, for the sake of the fact that I know people wanted to see both, I'm going to kind of keep going um, and try to keep this brief so I can answer questions. But um, those of you who have to go um, can go, and, I, and I, I appreciate your time, and I hope this was helpful to you. Um, in terms of literacy, um, there is that Park saw this as an opportunity to use texts that are really interesting and compelling in some way. So they're not going to use any commissioned pieces at all for the assessment. So lots of times assessment writers say we need a piece of text that will help us assess this. So they commission people to write a piece. Um, you know, Park thinks that when you ask someone to write something for an item, it's not vetted very well. It hasn't stood the test of time. So they want to use really good literature. So you're not going to see any text on here that's written just for the purpose of the test. Um, they're also going to develop only custom items. There's going to be no recycling of things, no tweaking of things. And just like in math, um, the assessment writers are going to have that document in front of them. Um, there's pretty much for the park design and ELA, um, the, the theory that if students engage with complex text and extract evidence from it, then they build knowledge. And so the whole test is, is kind of revolving around those three things that are important for your teaching um, and therefore should be important on the assessment. Those three core shifts um, kind of align with nine advances on the literacy assessment. Um, and these nine advances are important, and they actually relate to math as well in some ways. So um, Park is really committed to building this staircase of text complexity across the assessments from grades 3 through 11. Um, they're using different quantitative and qualitative measures to select the passages that will work. And um, again, you can. Um, you can rest assured that there's a lot of that going on in terms of making sure that the texts are appropriate for grade levels. Um, there's this theory that so often, this goes along with number two, um, so often in assessments, like they get packed full of text for kids to read. And so the setup of this assessment is they want to give students a chance to read carefully and reread if necessary. So they're really focused on quality text and not quantity. So they're thinking about providing good quality text but giving students enough time to read and reread and not give them there so many text to read that they can't do that. Um, in terms of vocabulary, which you're going to see in a little bit, they're not asking questions about random and obscure vocabulary. They're really um, trying to assess whether or not students can draw the meaning of the word from context. So um, the vocabulary questions are always very contextualized in, in a piece of, of writing that, that students take a look at. Um, this is this stuff here is kind of exciting. So um, students always have to cite evidence for their answers um, on the park assessment, which is what we do in our classroom. So it's kind of nice that the assessment is kind of catching, finally catching up. Um, there also are lots of questions on the park. This goes along with number five that have more than one right answer. So just like math, um, they're making, you know, it's authentic. There are lots of pieces of literature that you read and different people have different opinions and so they found ways to do that even within machine scored items which you'll see in a minute which is just quite interesting um, and finally again um, students are never going to be asked to write to a prompt ever 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 that's by itself there will always be given a text um, and ask questions about that text there's never going to be any like naked prompts that are that are kind of out there and hanging on their own which is nice um, and then this number eight is important for anybody six through 12, but I actually, this shows up in, in, in the item for grade three, so I guess it's everyone. Um, Park's gonna give students a chance to show what they do 
what they can do across disciplines. So there are science, social studies, and literacy passages right now in PARC. Um, Common Core says it's a priority to read across the content area. We know that's what students need to do to be college and career ready, so PARC is kind of devoted to doing that. Um, and finally, we talked about the research component a little bit. Students are going to be given an anchor text that they're going to read and respond to. Um, there'll be some questions to kind of guide them along to think about that text, and then there'll be kind of additional texts that they can choose from and synthesize. And, and again, you'll see an example of a, of a research item in just a sec. Um, so in, much like this, the math assessment where the standards for math practice are always in play, um, in ELA there are two standards that are always in play. So reading standard one, use of evidence, and reading standard 10, complex texts. Um, there are no items in the reading and writing part of the assessment that don't rely on both of these standards. They're critical in each and every item. So, um, so those are things that obviously, if they are in every single park item, um, they need to be going on in our classrooms every day. Um, we talked about these three task types for ELA, but I wanted to include this slide for you so you have the info. I think they'll become pretty clear as we look at the items. So in ELA, we kind of go backwards from grade 10 to grade 3. That was just the way it was presented to me. And as not an ELA person, I'm most comfortable um, sharing it with you in this way. So um, there's a literary analysis task that you can check out on the, on the, um, on the site where the item prototypes are. Um, and students are asked to carefully consider two literary texts that are worthy of close study. Um, they answer a few of those evidence-based um, response questions and a few of those technology-enhanced questions about the text. Um, and then they actually write a literary analysis of the two texts. So um, this is kind of, this is assessing the literature portion at the high school level. Those of you who teach high school know that um, it's 70-30 split informational text and literature. This is assessing the 30% part of that. Um, they really wanted to pick quality text. So um, this particular text from Ovid's Metamorphosis is a classic. It's inspired painters and poets. And so they look at all of that before they choose a piece of text. Um, they paired it specifically with this poem by Anne Sexton because um, she kind of takes the theme from that myth and refashions it. And that's one of the standards for students at the high school level to be able to compare texts that look at uh, something from different points of view. Um, this is not a full literary analysis text, it would probably have more of the, um, the smaller questions involved in it, but they wanted to kind of give you a sense of, of how it builds. So you can see here that this is an evidence-based selected response item. So um, these are two selected response questions that together form a single item. So part B asks them to supply evidence to support the theme that they, to support the theme that they selected in part A. Um, it allows for partial credit. Because if they get part B and they can choose two pieces of evidence from the text, even though they're asking for three, um, they still have the opportunity to get some partial credit. So again, um, much like in math, you'll never see traditional selected response in ELA, you'll never see traditional selected response without this evidence piece to back it up. Um, this is an example of an evidence-based sele selected response item for vocabulary, um, much like what we just saw there. Um, you, you notice that we, I told you standard one is always in play, that evidence standard, so they connect vocabulary to standard one. Um, and it also requires them to find evidence in the text to demonstrate comprehension. So. Um, the claim asks students to demonstrate that they can connect the context of a passage to the definition of a word. Um, and the passages and the questions are being carefully worded. So we don't do that old style gotcha where, you know, either you know the word or you don't. It's not about that. It's about can you use the context to help determine what this word means. So there'd be a few of those um, evidence-based um, selected response and technology enhanced um, responses all leading up to this prose constructed response item. So at this point, this is the last part of the task, and the other items have kind of led students through a process to gather the information they need. Um, and at this point now, they're asked to consider what's emphasized, absent, or different in the text. That language comes right out of the standards. Um, they're reminded to provide evidence from both texts, and again, standard one's always at play because we, you know, we've got that evidence piece going on there. So. Um, so you can see that the prose constructed response item would, would kind of look like this. 
Um, now we'll look at a research item. Um, so a research item, this is a grade 7 example, it's about Amelia Earhart, and again when you go out on the site you can see the actual text, I'm just kind of walking you through some of the important pieces. Um, this is the second type of task on the performance-based assessment, the, the last one you saw is, is one of the types of tasks, um, and this one is a grade 7 task, um, Amelia Earhart's disappearance is high interest for kids at this grade level, that's why they chose it. Um, the research simulation task is meant to be given in two different sessions, but Park envisions that there will be a they'll occur on the same day with a break in between. And once they get their policy document together, that'll be probably become a little more clear. Um, the text on Amelia Earhart that were chosen are content rich nonfiction on a topic that's historically significant. So again, we see that we're not just using literature texts; we're using social studies and science texts as well. Um, so what students are asked to do is, um, based on the information in the text, uh, let me back up for a minute. So the research, um, the research items do this. They ask a student to summarize some things. Um, then they do some, uh, some other kinds of items to help them organize their thinking. And then finally, they kind of synthesize and put their information together. So this is an example of step one where they just give them a text and they have them do some summarizing. However, um, the summarizing here is not just a straight summary, it's tied to a text-dependent question, so they can't just summarize in a way that regurgitates the text. They've really got to kind of um, frame it in the way that the question is asking them to, to do so. Um, that's followed on this assessment by a technology-enhanced constructed response item where students have to um, look at these three claims. And this was interesting because all three of these claims could be made about the text. The issue for them is which one has the most relevant and sufficient facts. Um, and then, of course, we ask for evidence. So because this is a technology-enhanced constructed resp response item, they choose a claim. And now they go out and highlight in the article, like they do in your classroom. Like They're not picking from a list. They're highlighting which claim did they use, which information supports. And that gives them flexibility to choose longer pieces of text, shorter pieces of text, um, things that they um, they think really help them to, to provide that kind of evidence. Finally, they get to this point where, um, where they're going to synthesize a bunch of information. Uh, they're provided with these three types of text you'll see. One of them is text on a web page, one of them is text that's actually a multimedia video clip, and one of the pieces of text is an article. So again, because we want students to be reading widely and dealing with all different kinds of information, that shows up on the assessment. So the assessment's trying to reward good teaching, good teaching to the standards, and not trying to do things that are not authentic, even though obviously the test is not terribly authentic. But uh, I think they're making a lot of efforts, which is a good thing. Um, this is an example of a narrative task for grade six, um, which is using um, Julie of the Wolves. And um, in a narrative task, students will read one brief text meant to be read in 10 minutes or less. Um, and they'll answer a few questions to help clarify their understanding of the text. And then once again, um, there's a bunch of short questions that are designed to help them gather what they need to write. So these questions that come in the middle are always carefully crafted to help them gather evidence. They're not just random questions, which again, I think is a nice piece. Um, so you can see an example of a technology enhanced selected response item here. This one's kind of neat because there's two correct answers. And so depending on which of these answers a student chooses, they then go out and drag and drop a sentence from the passage to support their choice. So, um, you know, it allows them to be divergent thinkers uh, as long as they back it up with evidence, which is what we want in our classroom. This is another example of a vocabulary item, same idea as before. Um, you can't just tell me about the item, you've got to go back and tell me what evidence from the passage helps you. Um, same here, you get the idea. She picks something, she's got to give some evidence. Now finally, this is an example of a narrative prose constructed response item. So um, the students are now asked to um, take the original story of Julie and the Wolves and write their own story to continue on where the passage ended. But it's not just a free write, they have to use what they learned about the character, Mayax, and tell what happens to her next. So all the items that preceded this that had them collect evidence, even the vocabulary item was really getting at Mayax's relationship with her father and a lot of her personality um, traits so that when they write this original story, they're looking for them to connect all of that. So narrative writing, but um, you know, making sure that it's again always connected back to the original text.
which is important. Um, the last item I want to share with you, and thank you for those of you who are still here because I'm going way over time, um, is a grade three item from the end of year assessment, um, how animals live. So the end of year assessment is going to have short to medium length passages, and this um, they'll all be scored for reading. So this is important. The end of year assessment will have no writing. All of the writing happens on the performance-based assessment. The end of your assessment will all be reading, um, and it's all machine scorable. So you'll be looking at a machine scored item. So what happens is students read a passage called How Animals Live, and they, um, they answer some questions. So what's the main idea? And again, they've got to always provide that evidence. Which sentence best supports the answer? So you can already see huge classroom implications here around evidence, 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 evidence. Um, Finally, this is a technology-enhanced constructed response item where students have to drag the words from this box into the location here to show the life cycle of a butterfly. Now, this is important because this is a science text and scientists often start from number one as the adult and then kind of grow and move to the egg. Um, this item is not testing the knowledge of the life cycle of a butterfly, so they purposefully chose a text where that's not the case. Um, where the author actually starts um, in a different place and moves students through the cycle in that way. So, um, so again, really testing reading and not knowledge of science. Uh, this is a pretty low-level third grade item of application. So um, they said they've got other things in the hopper where, you know, they've got graphic organizers as the technology enhanced constructed response item where students will be dragging and dropping into there um, as they move through the grade levels. So this was just kind of one example of, of their thinking right now around this. Um, I want to take you out to the park site really quickly to show you where all this stuff is located. Uh, when you get to the park site, you always want to click on the In the Classroom tab, and that's where all the good stuff is. So um, you'll see that the park model content frameworks are here. You can click on those and find your grade level um, in both ELA and mathematics. Um, you can also find the item and task prototypes here that I've shared with you, and there are many more that I did not choose. I chose to highlight the ones that I thought helped me best understand the assessment, so there are probably some out there that will help you even more. Um, so the samples are here for both math and ELA. Um, when you click on them, they tell you um, They've got the examples of the types of tasks, and they've got links if they've got that available to you right now at the different grade levels. Um, again, always organized by task type, so you can take a look and see what's available. Uh, Park is going to be adding some additional items in the next couple of weeks. So, lots of information, I know. Um, I'm seeing that there are some questions that came up during this. I'll try to answer them. If there are any more questions, I can answer those too. Nancy told me what she needed. Um, Mandy wants to know, can any student have the enhancements like kneecap? Any student can have accommodations. Um, yeah, I think, again, um, it's a policy piece. So um, if accommodations are written into an IEP or a 504, they can certainly have them. Uh, Park has said that Having conversations with the special educators on their one of their development teams has made them realize that some things they thought they would use as enhancements or accommodations, they're going to make available to all, but there still are going to be things that can be turned on and turned off. Um, Mi Young wants to know how's the, how is the performance-based assessment different from end of year? Tell us more. So the performance-based assessment is task-based. Um, when you look at these released items, performance-based is always type two and type three tasks, and it's always focused on math reasoning, modeling, and applications. Um, end of year would always be machine scorable um, and would always be type one. So if you go to your grade level and you look at the items that are there, I think that will help uh, really clarify that for you. Amy wants to know, do students have the ability to highlight or comment as they are reading? So in the research portion, yes, they will have a highlighter widget that they can use as they go along. Um, I'm not sure about the other places. I, I don't know if they'll be able to do that within every text piece, but that's something that I can ask Doug next time I, I have a chance to talk with him. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Uh, can you type in here and tell me if any of this was helpful? Or perhaps you've all, you're all doing something else and not listening to me anymore. I don't blame you. Uh, Julie says it was helpful. Mandy, I agree that it's overwhelming, so um, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the more we see the released items, the better off we're going to be. And right now, I was overwhelmed too, but I thought like part of my overwhelmedness well, is, is not, not knowing, knowing what's coming up. The more, the more information, information you have, the more, the more I'm going to 
uh, and there he is. So far, good. I don't know why I can't hear it. All right, so thanks everyone. I kept you really late. Um, like I said, Jim is teaching us, and um, I don't know why I can hear myself, so I hope that's not too terrible for you. Uh, Jim taped it for us, so I'll put it up somewhere so you can watch it again. And as you start to digest this, feel free to email me with any other questions. Um, have a good night. Thanks, Audra. Thanks, Jim. It was very helpful. Um, yeah, I think.